And uh, are we running? Okay. Interview of Lieutenant Colonel Patrick uh, Scarano. That's right. 23rd January 2001, Syracuse Armory. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassel. Videographer is uh, Mr. Wayne Clark. Uh, Colonel, real quick, where were you born and where did you grow up? Where was I born? Yeah. In New York State. <laughs> where in New York? Cortland, New York. Same address that I have here. And, and um, <clears throat> where did you go to school? And I uh, went to school at the uh, Cortland School System, uh, the high school, and then later on uh, I went to Cornell for a few years, and, uh, and then from there into service. What were you studying at Cornell? Oh, uh, the course I took at Cornell was uh, uh, dynamics and uh, 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 something to do with, with the heating engineer mm -hmm. and uh, that, that was the main course. How did you come to be in the service? Well, that, that's, a, that's a story. How did I get in the service? And why did I pick this avenue to get there? Uh, yeah, but, you know, back in... Um, I think it was in 1943, the war in Europe was getting worse. And uh, I was a pilot through the uh, CPT program that the government uh, gave out. And uh, I, won a, I won a scholarship from that high school. And from that, I got the flying a primary. And then if I passed that, I'd do secondary, I passed that, then cross country, and then from there, the instructor rating. And then I stayed there at uh, Peter's for a while, and then uh, the Navy man came through, and he was looking for recruits for the Navy, and uh, he says, go to, go to New York, take a physical at 50 Broadway. I took the physical, and they said I was a quarter of an inch short. I said, oh, my God, they wanted five foot seven. See, well, anyway, so I go back to Peter's. I was, uh, I was an instructor there because he kept me there. And then uh, I'm getting to pretty close to where I'm going now. And then I heard that Eastern Airline was hiring pilots. And so I took a day off. I went to uh, uh, LaGuardia Field to the Eastern Airlines uh, headquarters and they said we're hiring pilots for the military cargo division of the airlines. Now just about that time the government says we needed uh, uh, a lot of cargo planes, we're going to need a lot of pilots. So they hired me as a pilot with Eastern Airlines. They sent me to uh, school at uh, Atlanta, Georgia and I went through their school uh, multi-engine aircraft, the uh, instrument rating and all that. Now, uh, they were going to get C-46 commando airplanes uh, from uh, Curtis, from the government, and uh, the airlines were waiting for the production, and when they got that, then they would put me on the cargo division of Eastern Airlines flying C-46 airplanes with cargo from the U.S. to Europe. See, all right, so in the meantime, while we're waiting for, uh, for the airplanes to come in there, they put me on, Eastern Airlines put me on a domestic run, see, and until the planes came. So I was on a domestic run for about four months, flying the regular runs from New York to Miami, Houston, and so forth. Then, one day, uh, Eddie Rickenbacker, he was the owner and the president of Eastern Airlines, he called us pilots into the operation room. There's about 20 of us pilots. And he says, fellas, I have good news and bad news. First, I'll give you the bad news. The bad news is we're not going to get C-46 airplanes anymore because all the production that comes through, the U.S. Army has taken them, see? So we have a surplus of pilots I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to let you go. That's the bad news. In fact, he said that's the end of our cargo division of the airline. So now the good news. He said, as long as we trained you on multi-engine aircraft and instrument rating, meteorology and all that stuff there, uh, the U.S. Army will guarantee that if you go to a 90-day 
Officers Candidate School in Memphis. You will come out there with a commission as a second lieutenant and you will be in the service. So I went to Memphis, Tennessee. I was one of the, they called it a 90 day wonder. And uh, after 90 days, I graduated, got commissioned as a second lieutenant, and there I'm in the service. And then from there, uh, they, had, they sent me, my first mission was the Air Transport Command, the AC, ATC. See? And so that's how I got into it. Now I can continue out. Yeah, just, where were you in the ATC? Where did they assign you? Uh, the, in uh, Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, this was the Farian Division of the ATC, and, and this is this part here is really funny. The thing was, they said, well, now, Lieutenant, uh, we're going to send you to Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, to go through the instrument flight school. And I says, well, why do that? Because I just come out of Eastern Airlines. I've got a rating. I've got an instrument rating, the FAA. i got a multi-engine rating. And... Uh, this officer says, well, he says, that's okay, but you got to do things the Army way. So they sent me to Adams Field in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. I went through the instrument school. Of course, it was a breeze, you know, but uh, they says, hey, uh, we got something real good here. We want to keep you here as an instructor on instrument flight. So I said, whoa, what the hell? Anything like that, see? So after a while, after I instructed a few classes, they made me the chief check pilot. Now any of the students that went through the school, they would take a ride with me and it was up to me to either pass them mm -hmm. or if they were a little bit weak, to send them back for additional uh, training. See, all right. So shall I go on? All, all right. right, so you were a check pilot. All right. so, uh, we're going to get to when they sent me overseas to the home. See? Right. All right. So uh, uh, I was there as a check pilot, and then it was time for me to uh, to go overseas. I've been asking for uh, to be sent overseas, you know, because the the war effort and all that. So finally, my orders came through. Mm -hmm. They sent me to uh, Miami, Florida for overseas uh, duty. And the first thing they did was to give me a physical. Now, they gave me an overseas physical. If you ever took an overseas physical, what they, what they gave me was they, they got about 20 uh, officers in this one room in the medical division there. And they said strip, we stripped. And the doctor came in, he says, okay, fellas, he says, uh, uh, anything wrong with any one of you fellas, uh, step forward. If not, uh, put your clothes back on and uh, go down to the airport for uh, 1500 takeoff. So can you imagine that? That's an overseas physical. What I thought they were going to give me extensive electrocardiogram, blood tests and all that, but if the body's warm, your ends. <laughs> All right. So I went to. Uh, oh, I, I went to. Well, I was in Miami, but they said uh, with the orders, we want you to pick winter underwear. And get your winter clothes, winter underwear, and that's part of your gear to go overseas. And uh, so they sent me overseas. I says, Oh my God, with uh, heavy underwear, that means. I'm going to go to either Greenland or uh, a cold country. So two days later, I ended up in the Assam Valley of uh, India. Mm -hmm. Ha! It was during the monsoon season, and I said, "Ha! Winter underwear." <laughs> and I think the reason they they said pack your winter underwear is if there are any spies, as they were in that war, they'd say. The troop movement is going this way. So if they said the winter underwear to pack, then they say the troop movement movement is sending them north or to a cold country as a diversion. See, and they really uh, they really diverted if they ever thought that 
they found out troop movements, they, they, they were off the beaten path there, say. All right, so now I'm in Chabo, India. Shall I continue? Yes. How do I get on the hump? All right, now, when I was with Eastern Airlines, they did have a couple of uh, Curtis C-46 transports, and uh, we had a, a little time in it, not too much, but just a few hours, enough to get acquainted with the airplane and to check out uh, as a pilot on a C-46 airplane. So when they got their C-46 planes in, all they had to do was assign us to the aircraft, load up, go to uh, go to Europe with, with a load of thing here, say. Mm -hmm. Now, can, can I show you the, the map here uh, of the hump and, uh, and what I did? And I'll talk as as we go along. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, the one that I uh, this here, sir. Yeah, yeah. This this gives it a, a better uh, pictorial. Think of that. All right. Now, I was in in, in Mohanbari, India, and uh, at that time, 1943-44, there was a there was a blockade on the east coast with the uh, Nazi submarines and all that, and the shipping uh, was bad there. Also, China had a blockade of the submarines and all that, so the vital supplies for China came by ship up to about Calcutta, India, and then from there to the Assam Valley. All right, now they had vital supplies, and they also had 100 octane gasoline. This is for the B-29 bases that flew out of bases in China. Mm -hmm. All right, now my mission was to fly the C-46 transports from the Assam Valley. Now we would start here at the Assam Valley and that's all so the beginning of the leader road. Now they had the leader road and vital supplies going down the road, but uh, they were also fighting Japs and didn't have much um, much time or, or, or much material they went through. So they had to institute something better and that's when they called the Lifeline of China. That's when we started that. Now what we did there was we would start at the Assam Valley with a C-46 and with about 55 or 60 55 gallon drums of 100 octane gasoline. Okay, now this is in the C-46. All right, now we would take off, usually uh, in most cases a night flight, but anyway, we take off from the Assam Valley right here, and uh, the operation was to circle up to 15,000 feet so you could clear the Himalayas, the top of the mountains there were about uh, 15,000 feet. So we would spiral up and then head east for Kunming, China. Now, it would take approximately two hours. This was about a 400 mile trip. About two hours at 15,000 feet, mostly in the clouds. We'll get to uh, pretty close to Kunming, China, and then we turn on the beacon there, home in on the Kun beacon at Kunming, China, spiral down, and come down and land at Kunming, China. All right, then the trucks would be waiting there. They would pull up there. They would unload the airplane. In the meantime, we'd go and we'd have uh, something to eat. Uh, they would refuel the airplane ready for our trip back home, see. Now, going over, it was hazardous with the uh, bad weather and all that. Going back was even worse. It was worse in this respect, that we had the jet stream that flew from west to east, and sometimes that would be pretty strong, like it would be 50, 60 miles an hour, and in some case it went up to 100 miles an hour. So you're going now back home, you're going westbound into the face of the uh, jet stream. So it would take you longer. All right, now you go back, to the Assam Valley, pick up a beacon, circle down, 
to sea level or till you broke out of the overcast and land at the airport where you took off from. But here's the hazard. The hazard was that you'd get there about early morning and there would be fog. And what you would do would be to circle waiting for the fog to lift or go to an alter, alternate airport. Okay, well now, uh, if the fog didn't lift and the air, alternate airport was too far away, you would run out of gas, jump out of the airplane, lose the airplane, and whatever. See, so you lost a lot of ships that way. Mm -hmm. The other thing that you would lose a lot of airplanes was in this respect. On the C-46 airplane, it was a very good airplane. Are you familiar with the C-46? Yes. Okay, now, <laughs> we had 55 gallons of 100 octane gasoline, okay. At sea level, uh, the operation was that one of the crew members would go into the airplane and look and see if there's any leakers. If you had a bad spot, if it was a leaker, we wouldn't take it. Open the door, take it out, say, all right, so, uh, the crew member come up and say, Captain, uh, everything's okay. All right, so then we take off. Get up to 15,000 feet. Now at 15,000 feet, there's lower atmospheric pressure, so any flaw in that drum, you would leak gasoline. And gasoline fumes flow downward. So on the C-46, as you know, the gasoline fumes will flow down into the belly. All right, now, at sea level it's warm, but when you get up to 15,000 feet, uh, you're cold. So on the instrument panel of the C-46, there was a red button that says for heat, press the button. Okay, now, if you had a lot of fumes and it flowed down into the belly, and then you got cold and you pressed that button, uh, it was a putt-putt. The putt-putt, and uh, any spark there would ignite the fumes, and that was the end of that airplane. So that's that's another hazard. See? Let's hold on here for a minute. You got that? Yeah, <laughs> got that. Wait. Okay, this is a continuation of the interview with uh, Mr. Scarano, and uh, the interviewer is Wayne Clark. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Well, I just got through mentioning uh, the hazard of uh, flying the C-46 over the hump and uh, the dangerous weather and the updrafts and the jet stream over the Himalaya mountains. Now, uh, the War Department considered uh, the Himalaya mountains and flying uh, the lifeline of China as a combat zone. And as a combat zone, they had a criteria of uh, 750 hours of total time in that area and you have rotation to go home. Now, they, they also mentioned that uh, being in a combat zone, you were awarded certain medals for the amount of time that you've uh, flown over the mountains. So the first uh, medal that I received and earned was the uh, air medal, this medal right here. And this medal was given for 150 hours of pilot time over the Himalaya mountains. And the next one would be when you have accumulated 300 hours, uh, then you would be awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, which was a very good medal. Now, when you kept on uh, accumulating hours, you would have uh, another medal. In other words, after uh, 300 hours, uh, I would earn a, um, a cluster to the air medal. And then after another 300 hours accumulated over the hump, then there would be another distinguished flying cross. Now instead of giving you the medal themselves, they would give you a cluster for the medal that they already gave you. So I, mm -hmm. what I have is is the air medal with cluster. I have the distinguished flying cross with with cluster. And then, as long as I have this out, and I'm talking about medals here, uh, I have the World War II Victory Medal, 
and this medal here was the New York State Conspicuous Service Cross. Now you got that if you got any one of these other medals like the Air Medal and the Distinguished Flying Cross and you had a good service uh, with the service, the Air Service, then um, New York State would award this conspicuous, uh, dis distinguished, conspicuous medal and that's this one here. So that's about it as far as medals are concerned and uh, what you see here is uh, uh, my overseas medals, what they, when you have these on your, um, on your blouse, they call it fruitcake, but it's the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Air Medal with a Cluster, the Asiatic Theater, and I also got a medal for the war in the Asiatic Theater, which is the China Berber uh, India area. And uh, that's about it. Uh, these other medals here was uh, when I started out as a uh, second lieutenant and then promotion to first lieutenant. That's this bar here. And then the double tracks, what they call double track, is the captain's bars. And from there, uh, I got promoted to a major when I got back in the service. And then as I stayed in the reserves, and I accumulated time, I was uh, promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. All right, now, and these other wings here is the wings that the pilots wear, and what you see here is the uh, regular wing, and this here, after you've accumulated uh, about a thousand hours in the Air Corps, you would have what they call a command pilot's wings, and that's this here. and what you see here is dog tags. Those are familiar with anybody. I take them. And this is a, the citation from the government for notorious service. Uh, this one here was my card uh, naming me as an instrument pilot. And this was the pass that I carried. And this over here with the Scarano on it and uh, the emblem uh, that was given to me when I got out of the service and back home I was made a liaison officer for the Air Force Academy and this is the uh, emblem that was attached to that. Alright, that's enough for these medals here. Okay, I now, have one, one other question for you, sure. sir. You mentioned uh, you received the Order of the, the Purple Cloud? Uh, no, uh, uh, that, that's for China, and I'm coming to that right now. Okay. Yeah. All right, now, enough of this here, of uh, flying the hump. Now, uh, the war in China back in the early 1945 was getting much worse, and what the government had to do was to uh, get troops for the northern part of China and bring them down to the southern part of China to fight. And uh, so uh, they thought that I would do much better uh, being transferred to China on a C-47 airplane, which is basically the DC-3 Douglas. And when I flew with Eastern Airlines, I accumulated a lot of time and experience on the DC-3 Douglas, which is a C-47. So they thought it would be a good idea if they sent me to China and I would do some service with the C-46 airplane. So my first mission was to go to North China and pick up troops and bring them down to uh, Shantou or the southern part of China to fight the Japanese, as I said before, the war was getting much worse. So I had, took many trips up there and at one time uh, we had to transfer a uh, Chinese cavalry outfit from North China to the southern part of China. Um, now that was pretty tricky and uh, they didn't have much time and so they figured well uh, why not use the airplane. So they took my favorite C-47 and they would make some stalls and in those stalls they would put four horses and they would have a veterinarian uh, go along on the trip and when they put the horses in the airplane 
they would tranquilize them enough so that they would uh, be uh, calm for maybe a couple hours till we got to our destination and then they would unload the horses and everything would be okay. So everything goes along fine. We, we do several trips with the horses. But then one night we went for a cavalry outfit in North China. We took our usual four horses, put them in the airplane, tranquilized them for the two hours. And when I got south to my destination after two hours, the weather was very bad and I could not land there. And uh, what I had to do was either go to an alternate airport or wait out the storm. So what we did then is we went to an alternate airport that took another hour and a half. In the meantime, the tranquilizer wore off for the horses and uh, they didn't give them any more uh, uh, tranquilizers. They just stayed like that. So the horses got unruly and there's nothing to do there. Mm -hmm. We couldn't land because the weather was bad. And in one case, one of the horses took one of his hooves and he knocked it through the side of my airplane, a hole about as big as a watermelon. Now, did that but, affect the, the pressure of the no, aircraft? No, you see, it was a lucky thing that we had a C-47, but the, the C-47 at the time was not pressurized. So by putting a hole through the cabin, it was just like opening the window. It didn't have anything to do with the pressurization, say. All right, so now, we delivered troops from north to south, and we delivered a cavalry, or several cavalry outfits from the north to the south. Then another time came uh, delivering medical supplies to the communistic Chinese. And uh, if I could show you uh, a picture here, uh, this is China, and this is the Great Wall You've heard of the Great Wall of China. Well, the medical supplies that we had to deliver were to Yan'an, which was the capital of the communist Chinese government. And that was about 70 miles north of the Great Wall. So occasionally, we delivered medical supplies to the Chinese government, the Chinese communist government. But, it was not on a regular basis. Uh, it was had something to do with you had to get permission, authorization from the Allies to uh, fly the medical supplies to the communistic Chinese government. That was another entity by itself. So we did, after a while, deliver, uh, I, I delivered about two or three loads there, but getting to Yan'an, at this government there, uh, they didn't have adequate airports. What they had was a, a small strip in a valley, and it's a good thing we had the DC-3 because that landed and would stop in a short space. And that was it as far as uh, medical supplies north. Now, about this time, we had a surprise visit at our our base in Chanyi. The base in Chanyi was an airport that was about 90 miles north of Kunming and the elevation of the field was 7,000 feet. So we lived at 7,000 feet and then when we flew airplane we go from 7,000 feet up to about 15,000 feet. Well, now one day as a surprise visit we got a visit from Generalissimo Sean Kai-shek, he was the head of the Chinese government at that time. And uh, uh, we had about 40 of us pilots uh, that were around the barracks there. So we uh, stayed at attention and then we passed in review in front of the Generalissimo. And the Generalissimo says, men, I want to thank you for doing such a good job in maintaining the life line of China. And for that, I am going to award you pilots the Order of the Purple Cloud. That was a beautiful medal. I saw it, but I never got it. 
because what happened shortly thereafter the war is getting worse in China and uh, the the forces north the Japanese forces and all that they were coming down from the north down to the central part of China and then down to the capital of China and the Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek had to abandon his seat of government there and uh, and go to Taiwan. You probably heard that that he was in Taiwan. Well, now at that time, uh, the raid came so quick and they didn't know about it that they had to leave in a hurry. And the Generalissimo left, and he left most of his important papers right there at his office, his seat of the government. So. As it turned out, my medal, the Order of the Purple Cloud, the orders were in this bunch of orders, so I never got that medal. <laughs> Maybe someday uh, some Chinese ambassador might will me uh, the medal, and I hope I do get it. See, it's all right. It's possible. Could happen. Okay. Now, about this time. Uh, I've accumulated my 750 hours of flying the hump and, and China, and it's time to be rotated home. Okay, uh, let's just back up a little bit here. Yeah. Now, uh, as, a, as a pilot over there, did you ever encounter uh, Japanese aircraft, uh, fighters, or transports, or oh, bombers? I'm glad you brought that up because I might have missed it. Now, the Japanese were pretty smart people. They were smart pilots and all that. Now, what happened was this. Uh, we had some basic radar and uh, we're flying mostly in bad weather anyway. So coming back to Chan Yi, where I was based, we would circle till we got to the beacon, which was about uh, five miles north of the airport and after we hit the beacon and we knew we were there at a certain altitude then we would fly due south for about three minutes letting down till we broke out of the overcast and landed on the runway at Chan Yi. Now the Japanese as I said they were pretty smart they would see us someplace up the line and they would follow right in back of our airplane so that when the radar picked up the airplane over the beacon and they would see on the radar screen only one blimp because the Japanese fighter or bomber would be so close to our tail that from the radar all they would show is one blimp. Mm -hmm. All right, now here's what happened. They would follow us down letting down and when we broke out of the overcast over the airport and we would land the bomber the Japanese bomber they would come right over us and bomb the field and they would never know that they were coming in and that's what they would do and that's that's the only encounter I had with the Japanese aircraft was following me into the airport and bombing over my head when I when I landed. See. Now, uh, did you ever encounter uh, ground fire from any Japanese troops or uh, any type of artillery bursts? The only fire? ground fire uh, that I encountered it wasn't actually ground fire, but uh, uh, they would come over and uh, bomb the field. Now, if we happen to be in the barracks. Uh, the standard order was to grab our gear, uh, canteen or, or something like that, and head for the trenches. There was trenches around the base, and we would spend the night in the trenches uh, until the bombing was over with. And the next morning, we come back from the trenches, get back into our barracks. And that's the only actual uh, thing I had with ground fire or or face to face with Japanese. Did you ever hear the, the term uh, aluminum highway? The what? 
the aluminum highway? No. Okay. I I think it was had something to do with the uh, the amount of uh, aircraft that uh, were lost along the uh, the hump area. Oh no. No. I'm never not really. Okay. All right. Uh, now, uh, did you have any uh, uh, pilots that uh, flew uh, uh, part of the American Volunteer Group at all? If you know uh, that that came over like uh, 1940, that uh, flew with the uh, Nationalist Chinese at all? Um. Um, no, no, very rare that we'd see someone from the reserves that came before the war. Uh, there was a few. Uh, I didn't know exactly who they were, but they they flew with the Flying Tigers. The Flying right. Tigers were very active in that area, and uh, they started in the States uh, with P-40s, and then uh, they gradually uh, rotated to uh, duty in China, and we had quite a few of the flying tigers flying out of bases in China. Okay. Now, uh, your fellow pilots, uh, you had a lot of experience uh, when you went into the service uh, flying for Eastern Airlines. The, the, your fellow pilots, uh, did you find that they had as much experience as you, or were they lacking? Well. Uh, we didn't talk too much about there. There was one, one pilot that was with Eastern before I went to Eastern. He was there, uh, and most most of the pilots that I I flew with were uh, regular cadets that uh, went to uh, flying school and then they came there. And very few uh, of the pilots were from uh, from another airline. There were a few from other airlines, but uh, basically they were the young fellows. They were trained as uh, as cadets and and got to fly in there. And the reason the reason that I I got to be a first pilot uh, as soon as I got there was my experience that I had with the airlines. I didn't have to ride as a co-pilot for three or four months, so I got used to the airplane, and then we got. To be the captain of that airplane because I, I had already that experience. So when I went there, I immediately was put into the, the left seat as the captain of that airplane. Mm -hmm. Now your your crew, there was normally what a pilot, a co-pilot. Uh, did you have a uh, like a load master or a crew well, chief? Well, the crew. Now that's good with the C46 or the C47. We had a crew of three people. We had the captain, which is myself, we had the co-pilot, and we had the radio man. Now, the radio man was also the navigator. Uh, he would navigate, but he would have the, uh, the communications with headquarters, and uh, he would transmit all these messages via radio, and they could tell him uh, sometimes about where we were, and uh, so that that was the that was the standard crew of the, the three men. And as I said before, I only flew the C-47 and the C-46, and that was the crew members. Later on, uh, when I got home and I flew a hospital ship, that was a different story. That had the pilot, myself, the captain, mm -hmm. the co-pilot, then they had the flight nurse. And they had a medical attendant that was a four man crew. Okay. But I'm going to stop it right was... here to change film. Yeah. Now, uh, did you carry any kind of armament on your aircraft? No, there's no armament at all. Not a bit. All we had is our trusty 45 caliber pistols that we carried all the time, but nothing for any guns or anything, any bomb, anything. No, we were just just now, plain airplane. Now, did you carry any kind of survival gear uh, or parachutes or anything? Oh, like yes. That? Yes, that's, that's definite. We always had uh, on board, on every flight, we had our parachute. Now, the parachute, in the back of the parachute, 
the equipment they had in there was some survival gear. Uh, they had the machete. They had uh, a couple of flares. They had uh, uh, three or four packages of uh, uh, some kind of soya biscuits to eat. Uh, and possibly, uh, if we were over water, they would have uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, lures for, for fish to, to uh, try to catch fish when you're over water. And uh, of course the parachute and all that. And that's about it as far as survival gear. Oh, uh, a mosquito uh, lotion and uh -huh. stuff like that. That's, that's about it. Now did you ever have to bail out? Uh, not exactly, but there was a couple of cases there where uh, we run into ice and the, uh, the field was socked in and we're in the ice and we, at one time I had a C-47 in the uh, uh, China area and I accumulated approximately two to three inches of ice on the wings and I told the crew, I says, you better get your parachute on and uh, I'm going down as low as I can and if I don't break out and we run out of gas, uh, the red lights are on now, we're going to have to bail out. Now, at that particular time, my radio man uh, called in and he says, Hey, I got great news. We're pretty close to Shentu, and this is the first time that the government put in an instrument landing system. And here is the number, and if you'll fly a course of 270 degrees for about 10 minutes, you'll run into the beacon on the end of the runway, and they will turn on the instrument landing system for you. And so we did that, and we got to the beacon, we called in, they gave us the signals, they turned on the instrument landing system, and we landed, and this was probably the first time that an Army plane landed in China with the instrument landing system, and that was at Chen Tu, and Chen Tu was one of the main bases for the B-29 to bomb Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, what were the Chinese people like? Did you have much interaction with them? Oh yes, uh, they were they, they were good people. Uh, the reason I say they were good people, I, I did duty in China, or I mean, I did duty in India. And uh, when we were in India and we had time off, we'd probably go into town, a little small town, and we'd watch the people, and they would just mope around, listless and all that. That was their way of life. And then, when I did duty in China, and I landed, and I'd go into town like Kunming or something like that, you'd see the Chinese people, they were just walking fast, they all seemed like they were busy, and they were, they were good, hard-working, studious people. And uh, they would respect us, and uh, when you'd see them, they'd say, Dig how means everything's okay, you know. <laughs> and uh, every time you go to a foreign country, there's there's always some bad words that you pick up. There are some bad words in um, in China, and uh, if they didn't like you and they wanted to really give you hell, they would put their two fingers like that and point them to your eyes, and they would say, "Uzni maniki maniki tash." <laughs> that means that uh, you eat uh, dead mice. <laughs> but on the whole, I respected the Chinese people. Uh -huh. They were good workers. Now, did you uh, spend any time in Burma at all? Where? In Burma. Oh, in Burma. Uh, not in town, but I... Uh, at several times, we, uh, we had to land at Missional, Burma, that's the airport in Burma, and take on gas. Uh, I hate to say this, but there was a there was a colonel that was trying to make general. He did make it, of course. Uh, his name was Colonel Tunner. And what he did, instead of having our tanks full of gasoline, which would be eight hours of flight, he would tell them to give us three hours of gasoline in the airplane 
and the other gasoline that was left over that did not go into the tanks, he would put them in the oil drums. So now, at the end of the month, he would write down tonnage over the hump. And if he put uh, five or six extra drums of gasoline in my airplane from a Sam to China, he could write that off as tonnage over the hump. So, what he did then would have three hours of gasoline, we would take off from India, land at Mission of Burma, and then uh, get probably uh, take the the uh, the drums off and put some more drums in there for tonnage, and then he would put maybe two hours of gasoline, two hours of flight worth of gasoline in my tanks. So, in other words, there would be about 800 gallons of gasoline in the airplane and they would only fill me with 200 uh, gallons. And at one time, uh, they come over and I said to the gasoline man, fill up the tanks. He says, we can't fill up the tanks. We can only give you about one quarter of your usual capacity. And I got mad then. The weather was bad. And I said, I will not fly this airplane unless you fill up the tanks. And he says, I can't do that. And I said, go talk to your operation officer. Tell them that I'm going to leave my airplane here, stick with the airplane, and I'm not going to take off to fill my tanks. Well, he came back after a half hour and he says, well, I will have to do it. We'll have to fill up your tanks. So they filled up my tanks and I took off, finished my routine flight to China, and there it was. And uh, two months later, I saw by the, uh, the paper that the service has that Colonel Tunner was promoted to Brigadier General for the excellent job that he did flying uh, the supplies over the hump. So there you are. Now, uh, you were rotated back to the States before the war ended? Yes. Uh, I've accumulated 750 hours over the hump and China flying, and the routine was that you would be rotated home at 750 hours. Now, uh, this was in China. I came home from a flight one day and uh, uh, the Colonel Keegan, who was our commanding officer, called me into his office. He says, Lieutenant Scrannell, uh, I want to thank you for the good job that you've been doing here, but it's time to send you home. He says, on my desk, I have two orders. I have one order uh, promoting you to captain. The other order is rotating you home. I said, they're both on my desk. Now, he said, if I send them both in, they're not going to act on both of them. What they'll probably do is send you home as your present rank first lieutenant. So, I would suggest, if you, if I put in for your promotion first, and then you wait about two or three weeks, then I'll send in the orders for rotating you home. And that way, you'll go home as a captain. I says, oh, that's very good. But he says, it's, it's up to you. And I says, well, I'm anxious to go home, but if I go home as a first lieutenant, uh, there won't be much for me to do. But if I go home as a captain, I'll be able to swing a good position as a pilot on a bigger airplane. So uh, I'll take my chance. I'll send in my promotion first, and then I'll wait for orders to go home. So that's exactly what had happened. He sent in for my promotion that came in, and then two weeks later, he sent in for my rotation home, and that came in. So I went home as a captain. Now, the bad thing about that, at that particular time, my order said to leave Changyi, China, and fly by military aircraft to Karachi, 
India. From there, I would get a shuttle and go to Casablanca. All right, now, when I got to Karachi, the minute I, I got into the airport and uh, showed my orders, uh, we heard that uh, VE Day, the Japanese or the, uh, the people in Europe Capipia, capitulated. Capitulated, see. And uh, so that was V Day. Now, the problem was this. They froze all orders to go home right then and there. And they said for me to wait until further orders. And I didn't know what. And the rumor, there was a rumor that uh, we were going to concentrate more on ending the war with Japan and that through the, instead of going home, they were going to divert us to another part of China. Well, I was downfalled. I was anxious to go home. Now, while I'm sitting there, a friend of mine that I knew back in the States at OCS came by and he says, Pat, what are you doing here? And, and I told him what I was doing. I was being rotated home, but my orders were frozen. And uh, what could I do? And he says, well, you know, what I'm flying is a, a supply ship from Casablanca to Karachi. And uh, I'm going to unload that and get something to eat and refuel the airplane. And I'll be taken off in about uh, two hours back for Casablanca. But he says, I cannot take any passengers. I have a C-46 airplane that's parked in the north ramp number 766, but I cannot take passengers. I said, oh, thank you, Jim. Good luck to you. So after he left, I took my B-4 bag and I snuck over to the north ramp. I got in the airplane, got in the tail where the toilet was, closed the door. Okay, then an hour later, I heard the engines start up <laughs> and uh, then take off. And then about 10 minutes later, I got out of the can in the back, went to the cockpit, and it says, hey, hi, Jim, Pat, I knew you'd take my hint, see? All right, so now we landed the next day in Casablanca. That's the end of his trip and the end of my trip. So now I'm in Casablanca. I went up to the operation officer, and I says, uh, when is your next flight home? And he says, how did you get here? And I says, well, I come by military aircraft. He said, let's see your orders. The orders said to go home, but that I was frozen in Karachi. He says, you know what you're going to do? You're going to take the next airplane going back to Karachi. You stay right here. That's it. You did something wrong, and you can't go home. All right. So I sat there downhearted, of course, and... An hour later, the same officer came to me and he says, I hate to tell you this, but I've got some important papers to go to the States and they're going to go by courier service, but I can't send them by anybody. I have to send them with a, an officer and you as a captain, you are eligible to take it. And he says, would you like to take the courier to the States? I said, do I ever? Was I happy? So what they did then was they took this pouch and they strapped the handcuff to my wrist with the uh, important papers. And then I, I got on the airplane and I landed in Bangor, Maine. And that was the end of overseas. See. What was it like uh, coming back to the States? Oh, I was so happy. Uh, I, I, I was the happiest man in the world. I come back to the States and uh, then I went home on leave and uh, saw my family. I saw my daughter that was born while I was in India, uh -huh. uh, a three months old little girl, Charlene. Oh, she was a beautiful thing. And oh, I was so happy to be home. So I was home for 30 days and then I had to I had to go on my next mission. So 
Okay. Uh, My next mission. All right. The next mission now. They sent me to Romulus uh, to be a captain on a hospital ship. Now, where was Romulus? This is Romulus uh, base in Michigan. So. Okay. Yeah. Now, uh, just before I, I was sent overseas while I was in Little Rock, I took several flights as a co-pilot on a hospital ship, so I was familiar with that. So what they did, they did send me to Romulus, and they gave me a co-pilot, they gave me a nurse, and a flight, and a, a medical attendant. See, there was four people in our crew, and we had a C-47 airplane, and we would take off from Romulus with a pocket full of money, because <laughs> we were going to be gone for a month, and we would fly to Mitchell Field on Long Island or Fort Dix in New Jersey. And we would take pa patients that came from the European theater. They're usually maybe uh, about uh, six litter cases and four or five ambulatories. And we would fly them from the East Coast, Mitchell Field or Fort Dix, west. And we drop off these patients to a hospital nearest to their home. It could be uh, St. Louis, it could be Cleveland, Ohio, and we would pull up, land at the airport, drop off the patients, and then work our way west from St. Louis to Kansas City and Denver and right on that way. And then when we dropped off our last patient, then would we proceed to Hamilton Field in California. Now, after a couple of days of maintenance on the airplane, refueling and something else, then we'd get ready for our mission going east. Now, when we were in uh, Hampton Field in California, we would take patients that were injured in the Pacific Theater and fly them east, the same thing nearest their home. We could drop off a couple of patients in Ogden, Utah, uh, continue on to Wichita, uh, Cleveland, whatever. When we finished, dropped off all our patients, then we returned to Robinus, Michigan, and uh, after uh, uh, several days, then we do the same routine again, fly to the East Coast and come back there. Now, while I was flying, the hospital ship. One night we were flying, uh, uh, I think, South Dakota, and I was homing in on a beacon there because uh, back in those days they didn't have the airway control, mm -hmm. the airways. We had a, a radio beacon, and the radio beacon we had on this airplane, you would home in on a broadcast station. See, and they would have music, whatever. And this one night I was tuned in on a station over South Dakota and I heard that the Japanese capitulated. It was VJ Day. So there was the end of World War II flying at 12,000 feet over South Dakota heading west. <laughs> and then shortly after that I came back to Romulus went home on leave, and uh, then uh, was, was sent to Rome, New York, for separation, and I separated uh, from the service then. But that was not the end. Okay. I, okay, I stayed in the reserves. Okay, and you uh, retired when? Okay, well, uh, I retired in... Uh, about 1972, but uh, I stayed in the reserves. And what I did then was uh, I was made a liaison officer for the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. And what I would do then would be to go to a high school uh, in uniform and uh, talk to the seniors, the men or the women too for that matter, and uh, tell them that 
we would like to have them in the service and when they got out of high school they graduated that they could pick either going to the Air Force Academy, Annapolis or West Point and the thing that they had to have to do to get to their congressional representative, a congressman or a representative and tell them that they would like to be picked for the Air Force Academy or Annapolis or West Point. And so what they would do then, they would do that and then the congressman would have two or three students that he would uh, send to these academies. So I was a liaison officer and uh, I spent two weeks of active duty in the summertime at the Air Force Academy. I saw the students that I helped get through there. And uh, then I also, uh, see I stayed in the reserve for 20 years. Okay, let me, let me sure. just uh, back up a little bit. Were you in the reserves when uh, the Army Air Force became the United States Air Force? Yes. Yeah, what was that like? Yes, well, what that was like, uh, uh, we would meet uh, once a month at some armory or something around our hometown, uh, Cortland or Binghamton or whatever there. And uh, we'd, we'd put in our 50 hours of studying or act or duty somewhere, and that would be a satisfactory year toward my retention for retirement. Uh -huh. All right, now, while I was there, uh, it must have been about 1950, the orders came through making the Army Air Corps into the U.S. Armed Service. Yeah, I, I think that might have been 1947. 1947, the U.S. Air Force. And what they did, they gave each one of us uh, officers, I think, $200 to go out and buy a blue uniform. So I took my money and I went to Rome Air Force Base and I went to the commissary there or the PX and I picked out a nice blue uniform, hat and all that. And so from then on, I was U.S. Air Force. That's... That was a memorable occasion. Now, did uh, did you do any service in Korea when the Korean War broke out? No, no, I, I didn't do I didn't do Korea. Uh, I was waiting, uh, but uh, it was a short war. I think only about a year, and uh, uh, so they they never did call me. But I I had everything ready, and if they said let's go. Uh, I could get all my uh, household things in order and I would go just like that. See? So I, I never went to Korea. But uh, I take it you, you enjoyed your experiences in the military and... You... Oh, definitely. And another duty that I had that I loved very much was uh, uh, I was a uh, liaison officer with the Civil Air Patrol mm -hmm. and uh, at one time they sent me to Harris Hill as the commander of the encampment for the Civil Air Patrol cadets. And uh, what they would do, they would take the cadets and send them to Harris Hill, give them uh, ground training and put them in a glider and uh, get so that they could fly the glider alone and they would get a license as a glider pilot. And I was the commander of the encampment in charge of uh, probably 50 or 60 Civil Air Patrol cadets, male and female. And uh, so that would be my two-week tour duty, would be the encampment there. And then uh, later on, uh, I would go to the Civil Air Patrol uh, encampments or whatever and do whatever I could for the Civil Air Patrol. And for that, uh, I think later uh, on I got this uh, uh, Air Force Commendation Medal for my work that I did with the Civil Air Patrol. Okay, now do you belong to uh, any veterans organizations uh, like the Hump Pilots Association or Yes, I'm like a that? member of the Hump Pilot Association and also uh, uh, 
uh, joined the VFW when I got home. In fact, uh, uh, about two months ago, uh, I, I had a pin and, uh, and a little emblem with 50 years. I was a 50-year member of the VFW. That's great. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, anything uh, that, that comes to mind? Uh, any humorous experiences or anything like that? Well, I got a few that I, I don't want to put on put on tape because it might go to the wrong uh, the wrong uh -huh. sources. But I do want to thank uh, the governor George Pataki and uh, uh, George Basher for giving me the opportunity to get my experiences uh, uh, for the people now and for the future things. Uh, the part that, that I'm kind of uh, kind of shaky about, you can clip it off if you don't think it's proper, but when I was flying the hump, uh, one night my roommate says, Patrick, he says, I've got cargo going to China, and what do you think is on the manifest? There's a grand piano assigned to Madame Chiang Kai-shek, because you know that uh, the Generalissimo's wife was a, a concert pianist and very good, and for some reason our government wanted to cement relations with China, so they thought what better way than to send a grand piano to Madame Chiang Kai-shek. So they put it into this cargo plane instead of the gasoline and some other thing and uh, my friend flew the regular course and the more he flew toward China with his load the madder he got and he says what in the hell am I doing with the war effort flying the gasoline for the beat 29s and we got this darn piano assigned to Madame Chiang Kai-shek. So the further he flew toward China, the madder he got. So after a while he, he bent down and he shut off the gasoline on one engine and the engine quit. So we said to the, uh, the crew, uh, the standard procedure, when you lose an engine you jettison the cargo because you want to save the airplane and to hell with the cargo. So they went out back, they opened the door, and they kicked out the grand piano over the Burma jungles. <laughs> so when they got to Kunming, China, the truck pulls up to get the piano, and uh, they said, where's the piano? And the captain says, you know, I lost an engine over the hump there, over Burma, and uh, there was something wrong with the cross feed and I had a jettison cargo. Then later on I filled around with the cross feed and checked the tanks and I found that there was a short on one of the valves there. So I opened another valve and the gasoline came in. I started that engine and so I continued the trip here with both engines. And so <laughs> that was the humorous. Well, Maybe it was humorous, but if Madame Chiang Kai-shek got mad and told the Generalissimo, those pilots from Chan Yi were used, told them they were going to get the purple cloud, forget them, uh -huh. you know, and maybe, maybe that's why I didn't get my, uh, <laughs> my order of the purple cloud. Now, did you uh, keep in touch with any of your flying buddies after the war? Um... Uh, not, not, not too many. Uh, some, uh, some nearby I would, but uh, they were from all over the country. They were from California and all that. And I did have a couple of buddies in Michigan that I kept in touch with, but there was one officer in California that called me in the middle of the night. And he says, Patrick Serrano? I said, yes. He says, you flew the hump, didn't you? I said, yes. He says, well, I, I had your name here, and uh, about 
uh, once a month I go down the list and I pick out somebody there and I call them and I, I say how you doing and all that just for the hell of it. But I, I never went that far. Uh -huh. so. uh, anything else you'd like to add about your experiences? Uh, no, it was a good experience and the Lord was with me and uh, the main thing back then and I don't know if you could do it now if you are the commander of that aircraft it's up to you as a commander to make sure you have a safe return of the airplane and the safety of your crew. In fact, uh, to go back to that C-46 flying at 15,000 feet, when, when I flew the hump there, I would tell my crew, when you fly with me, I want you to wear your sheepskin underwear, your underwear and your sheepskin flying suit, because when you fly with me, I do not turn the heater on. I fly blue and cold, but I return. And the same thing with you. And so I did that. I did not use that heater. I come back blue and cold, but, but I came back. See, Well, as I said before, it's up to the captain of that aircraft to look after the crew or look after the airplane or the come, come hell or high water. There's a good many times that uh, I was in China, uh, sleeping in uh, an operation room at the airport, and the one time uh, an officer come over to me and he says, you're Lieutenant Scrano? Yes. He says, uh, I'm going to take your airplane. We need it. I says, what? You're going to take my airplane? How, am I, how are we going to get home and all that? And where are your orders? And I said, look, you see what I got over here? This is a 45 caliber pistol. You touch that airplane and you're going to get it. You see? Uh -huh. So you get somebody else's airplane. So he never touched my airplane. So like I said, take care of your airplane, bring it back home. When you're in, uh, in Burma, they want, want to get you short on gas, you say, no way, I want to save the airplane put the gasoline in there or I don't fly the airplane. So as a captain of that aircraft, remember to do your duty. Now, uh, as a civilian, you went back to flying for the airlines? I went back to the airline and uh, I said, I'd like to come back because you promised me when we got back from the service that we could come back here. And I says, uh, how long will you take before you can check me out as a captain? Because I've been in China and I've got probably uh, 2,000 more hours on a C-47 and that's what they're flying at that time. See, so uh, I'm a much better pilot than I when, when I left here. So they said, well, well what's, what's your uh, number, your service number? And I said, uh, that's number 527. You know, I was a co-pilot with the airline then, and uh, they says, oh my God, uh, you've got a very low number here. It might be uh, two years before we can check you out as a captain. I says, hey, I'm not going to fly as a co-pilot for two years and waiting to be captain. Well, as it turned out, uh, within six months or so, uh, aviation expanded and I could have been a captain, see? Mm -hmm. but I went home. Uh, I got into the furnace and appliance business because there was a, a big demand for appliances and all that. So I opened up my store and I, uh, I did that for a couple of years and then I figured, hey, I'm a young man, I still got a lot of flying left in me, so I'm going back to flying. So then uh, I made a resume, I sent it to some of the uh, the big manufacturers and uh, the stores and uh, uh, firms in the Syracuse area and one man, J. Stanley Coyne, who ran the Coyne laundry system, called me in and he says, 
Patrick, uh, I, I love your resume. If you come to fly with me, uh, uh, here's my airplane. Uh, you can fly with me tomorrow and see if you like it. You can fly with me three or four days a week. And the two days that you don't fly, you can go out in the field and uh, do some selling for me. To sell garments to to Gender Electric or whatever. And so that's that's what I did. I went back to flying. And I flew for this man out of Hancock Field for about 12 years. And um, then after that I came back home. I did charter work. And uh, uh, so that, that was that was about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, in closing, anything else you'd like to add? What else could I say? Okay. Except that I was born in New York State. I'm going to die in New York State. I think Pataki is a good man, and it's an em empire state. And uh, I, I think I think I like it. Okay. Well, thank you, sir.